Good evening and welcome to the 2013 Sir William Pickering Lecture, sponsored by the IPENS Foundation. My name is Sam Kikini brown I'm the Wellington Branch Chairman, and tonight I have the pleasure of introducing this lecture and our speaker. This lecture takes its name from the great Sir William Pickering, who was New Zealand-born rocket scientist who headed California's Jet Propulsion Laboratory for 22 years. He was a senior NASA luminary and pioneered the exploration of space. After retiring in, retiring in 1976, Sir William returned home to support the betterment of science, engineering and engineering in New Zealand. He was the first sponsor of the IPENS Foundation. Sir William was a leader in, in the engineering community and he was one of the world's most eminent engineers. It is only fitting then that tonight's speaker has also demonstrated outstanding leadership and is a role model for other engineers. The topic of tonight's talk is how an engineer spots new technology and creates a billion dollar business. Engineering, science and technology, or more broadly knowledge, is a force that has allowed mankind to forge new frontiers and shape the new world. But ultimately, how can we use this knowledge and its commercialisation for not only the betterment of the world, but also for the wealth and health of the New Zealand society? Our speaker tonight grew up with Tony and started his professional life as an engineer from which he has carried on to live what can only be described as an amazing, accomplished life as an entrepreneur, philanthropist, sportsperson, businessman, engineer and passionate New Zealander. In 1975 he founded the microwave telecommunications business MAS Technology, which was not only an overnight new business but also created an entirely new market. He along with others grew mass into a multinational company now listed on the second largest stock exchange in the world. Furthermore, mass and its successor companies have earned over a billion dollars in net foreign exchange for New Zealand. From the success of Mass, he went on to found the Sustainable Technology Venture Capital Fund, Endeavour Capital, in 1998, with dreams of helping to create another industry not yet in existence in New Zealand. He continues his pursuit currently with great success with investments in 35 international companies. He has also been recognised for his efforts in the business world and the community. A few highlights. In 1999, he was inv invested as a companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit. In 2011, he was awarded New Zealand's top engineering award the William Pickering Award for en Engineering Leadership. And in 2012, he was awarded Wellingtonian of the Year. So without further ado, please join me in welcome mm -hmm. Neville Jordan. Thank you, Sam, and distinguished guests all. I must admit to feeling slightly nervous and trepidatious in addressing the audience of my home city. And I feel a wee bit like Elizabeth Taylor's eighth husband on their wedding night. And he would have been thinking, I know what to do here, but how can I make it interesting? <laughs> so to make this lecture interesting, I thought I would talk about some early experience that I had in growing up in Petoni and then uh, how I got into engineering in the first place, the kind of lessons that have been learned along the way, and then using those lessons to try and project us into the future to speak to the theme tonight, how do we spot future opportunities that will add to the prosperity of our country, particularly through exporting. So I'd like to start with the question, are engineers born or are they made? And so there are no prizes for guessing who that is, and you would never guess uh, that that one-year-old might turn out to be an engineer. But what I would like to say here and to, is to uh, talk about my upbringing in Petoni, which I think uh, if you understand that background, then that will give you a guide as to uh, where I've ended up in uh, engineering and in business and in exporting. So I, uh, as Sam said, I was born in Petoni, went to Canterbury University and lived offshore for three or four years working for a big multinational and came back uh, and started my own company. But I think uh, before all that, it's important to understand perhaps my upbringing. My, when I was born, my mother was 25, and people will say, well, that seems fair enough. Uh, my father was 60, 
And so some people have said to me, have you inherited his genes? Well, I, I'm not too sure. But that big disparity in age uh, was quite important because my father had been on the landing at Gallipoli and was one of just the, uh, in command of one of just two of the artillery pieces that made it ashore uh, on that landing. Uh, he was there for the duration and in October of 1915, uh, then went, was uh, taken off, went to the UK for a while, and then went to the place uh, that we now call the Somme, and spent the rest of the First World War on the Western Front. So I grew up with stories of the First World War, and what that meant, and what that meant to him, and so I grew up with this very strong uh, feeling of independence, of self-reliance, of self-sufficiency. And that has sort of come out in my engineering and business career. More than that, uh, I came home from school one day and uh, found my father dead when I was quite young. So that led also to reinforcing this great independence and self-sufficiency and resourcefulness. So at age eight, I was delivering vegetables up and down the streets of Petone, and at 13, wanting to earn more money to buy school uniforms and books and so on, a next door neighbor said to me, uh, would you like to work at the local freezing works? And for those that remember it, that was the Mia Gear Meat Company in Batoni. So at 13, I said yes, went down to the freezing works the following day, and the foreman said, uh, mm, you're 13, he said, look, we'll sign you on, we'll put your age on 15, you look big enough, come back tomorrow, but for goodness sake, don't wear those school short pants. <laughs> so I uh, worked in the freezing works on the chain for a start, and became quite skilled at washing down carcasses. So I got a big promotion to go into the manure works and make dried blood. Uh, it was highly skilled, it was really good money, and I found out why, because no one else wanted to do it. However, uh, I was able to have almost a kind of a semi-permanent job there and worked uh, for uh, each long holidays for the next six years or so. And in the shorter school holidays, I worked for the local council, mostly cleaning out the sewer pipes and drains. So uh, you can imagine as a 13-year-old growing up uh, with people in the freezing works and in the sewer gangs, you have a lot of lifelong learning. <laughs> I wanted to summarize here uh, the theme of this evening, and so with that, uh, early experiences background. This has been somewhat of a trajectory uh, of uh, how I've uh, grown up and developed and developed into this uh, discipline, this business that we call engineering. First of all, there is the exploratory phase of cycling around Petone, uh, finding out what the world was about. Then the atomic bomb period, I'll come to that very shortly. In uh, Crystal Sets and a Hikers 1, I suspect there will be very few people here who remember Hikers 1 one-valve radio sets, which uh, every kid seemed to build in those days. Then TV set, uh, university, off to the US, working for the government, IBM, mass technology, Endeavor Capital. And I want to come back to that very top uh, couple of words at the top of the spiral on social impact. So, if we talk about uh, finding ideas, identifying ideas, and developing ideas uh, to add to our prosperity, uh, then I think it's interesting to look at uh, a bit of a case study here, because I started off, first of all, designing for others. So this was in what was then called civil aviation in air traffic control engineering, and then into IBM to do uh, software work. Then I started my own company in uh, 75, and that was designing for uh, my own company. That company uh, grew very strongly. We had a, an outstanding team of uh, designers, of engineers, applied scientists, software engineers, 
And so that uh, grew the company through to a very successful listing on the NASDAQ stock exchange. In the late 90s, I was able to uh, then sell out the remaining shares and invest into venture capital. And then of late, keeping on investing, but I've put in there uh, with a social component. So, the so by the social component, I mean that not just investing in a, uh, an operation for a return on capital, but it's become very clear that if we look at that theme of how to spot a billion dollar uh, opportunity for the country, then we do need to look and be mindful of the social sciences and the society that we're creating. For example, a lot of large investors are saying, if we don't take care of the society, if we don't understand that the very fact of investing unwisely is fragmenting and pulling apart the society, then in just a few years, then the environment for investing is not going to be that good. So therefore, we had better give thought to how do we improve the lot of many, many people now so that we have the environment in which to better invest later on. So that's the theme that we currently have at Endeavour. What are some of the things that can be done to improve the social fabric so that the uh, environment in the future for investment is so much better and we haven't destroyed or corrupted the society in the process? There's been uh, talk of success so far, but of course there have been some oops, and people might be saying, well, that's all very well, uh, he seems to have done okay, but he must have had some failures, let me talk about the failures. The first one was a failure of my mother. If uh, many people here will remember back to when uh, television first came in, there were licenses. I think they were about $80 or so. And at about uh, 16, I had built a television set which was proudly sitting on a chair in the uh, passageway in my mother's home in Petoni. One day there was a knock at the door and this fellow said, uh, excuse me, we've been cruising up and down the streets with a, an antenna looking for uh, signals emanating from TV sets and you seem to have a television set. My mother, of course, being terribly enthusiastic about my electronics career, said, yes, 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 we have a television set. And the fellow said, oh, that's good, is it working? And she said, of course it's working, my son built it. And he said, well, uh, could he have a look? And so my mother invited him in, he saw that it worked, and said, oh, that's really good, now here's a bill for $80. <laughs> so uh, I wish I had a better shielded that television set so it uh, would not radiate radio waves. The second one is much more fundamental, and in the late 80s, when Bell South came to New Zealand with mobile radio, they gave my company a call, Mass Technology, and said, look, when we look at the coding of the mobile uh, telephone signal, there's a bit of a gap every so often, and a lot of signaling takes place, the com uh, network commands take place within that gap, but there's even more space in there. We think it might be useful, perhaps, uh, could some of your designers, your engineers, look at that? So we duly looked at it, and the engineers came back and said, oh, this is really a tiny uh, gap in the signalling. You could only fit about 100 or 150 characters in that tiny gap. So and some people have already guessed, and it won't be of any use to anybody. So we called Bell South and said, look, I'm sorry, uh, we won't take up the opportunity. Uh, we don't think it'll be very useful at all. How many texts are now sent per day? Probably uh, several million texts, and we gave that away. So that was a big failure of not spotting uh, an opportunity. Fish trading, we had an uh, investment in an online uh, company based out of Auckland, trading fresh fish. Uh, they also did oysters, white bait, uh, and mussels. And one day we had a board meeting and said, this is, uh, company's not going too badly, what else can we do with this? And we looked abroad and saw eBay. And then though we were full of wisdom on the board 
and said, well, of course, that's a very, very large company. And so it'll be very difficult to compete against eBay when they come to New Zealand. Well, of course, they barely came to New Zealand because Trade Me had started up and we missed the boat entirely. So I want to uh, give you some uh, balance here and particularly to go on to the atomic bomb which failed to explode. Another failure, but in a perverse way led me into electronics. For those that have been up and down uh, Aurora Street and Batoni, this is where I grew up. Now, and it's not generally known, in fact, it's hardly known at all. But that was the first atomic bomb site in New Zealand. <laughs> and why was this? Because at age uh, 13 or so, when other kids were experimenting uh, with ammonium nitrate, making black powder, gunpowder, things that went bang, then I didn't think that was good enough for me. But I'd seen in a popular mechanics magazine an outline drawing of an atomic bomb. And I thought, these other kids are experimenting with gunpowder. I will make an atomic bomb. So in looking at this, it seemed pretty easy to make because it seemed to be a sort of a, a couple of spheres of, of this uh, metal stuff that came together. And there was something else suddenly to trigger an explosion. And so this seemed pretty easy. So I went down to the local pharmacist, for those that uh, know Petoni, it was Burns Pharmacy in Jackson Street. And I said to the pharmacist there that uh, I was going to make an atomic bomb. <laughs> and he had, uh, through the previous few years, uh, sold me various acids, alkali, uh, a bit of sodium and potassium here and there. And he said, well, unfortunately, uh, this uh, metal, uranium, was actually a bit hard to come by. And he didn't have, have any in stock that week. So he went into the back and brought out this chart and explained to me the periodic table. And he said, now, if you look at this stuff that you want, uranium, and I think it's in at uh, atomic weight 92, and he said, but if you go up just a wee way, and here is uh, lead, and that's at 82, and it's pretty close to uranium. So you probably won't get a big bang, but you know, you might, you might get something. So I spent weeks and weeks and weeks going down to the local dump, collecting the lead of lead head nails, collecting the lead of flashing, and melting it down into a tennis ball shape that I'd put into the garden, poured the lead into that, and got two hemispheres of lead. I got gunpowder out of uh, fireworks and assembled it into a piece of steam pipe. Steam pipe because it had a very thick wall and I thought when this goes off, this is going to make quite an explosion. Then I thought, uh, how is this going to be triggered? And I thought, well, I can hit it with a hammer and that even for a 13 year old, the logic in hitting this thing with a hammer if it went off didn't seem to be a very good idea. So I thought the best thing to do is uh, climb up on the roof of my mother's house. And so here, the gable, this highest point here. I spent weeks climbing up on the roof and dropping the steam pipe with the two hemispheres of lead with gunpowder in the middle on the concrete waiting for it to go bang. And it never did. So the, I went to the pharmacist and, pharmacist and said that uh, this wasn't very successful. And he said, well, maybe I wasn't destined to be a nuclear physicist after all. And he probably thought we don't want this kid wrecking Petoni. So he said, look, you might be interested in electronics. And he had a crystal set, uh, which he showed me, and then introduced me to another neighbor uh, and who showed me how to put a crystal set together using a piece of coal and a razor blade, some high impedance headphones. And when I heard all of the then broadcast radio stations coming in at once, then I was totally hooked on electronics or radio first, wireless, and then electronics. So that's how the career started off, to a total diversion from being a nuclear physicist to being totally absorbed in engine or the uh, a foretaste of engineering. 
So the discovery of new ideas is something that's very important and in speaking to the theme, how do we go about that? I think it's a good place to start to say what do we know and what don't we know because if we understand this as a starting point, then we can start to say, well, how we might project ourselves into the future to see what opportunities might be around within which to develop companies. So once again, I want to bring or return to this uh, social capital idea because these are very, very strong bonds that exist in communities, in precincts, uh, in small groups uh, within large cities. So they really matter in tough times. Think about the resilience that has been shown in many parts of Christchurch where communities have come together, these strong bonds are being exercised and they're able to uh, uh, show resilience and, and get themselves through tough times. So these, and these are um, mutual help which bring these strong bonds. So I think that uh, these are the things that we have to recognise when we look into the future. If we also look into the future and take a look at LinkedIn, Twitter and Facebook, the use of course is very, very large, but it's also decreasing. And it's decreasing uh, in favour of particularly young people who want to be able to talk and leave uh, voice messages around an image, for example, and not be too worried about keyboarding, uh, uh, not even text messages of 100, 150 odd characters. So this is not just push to talk, but the ability to speak and have that speech transmitted as a message. The other thing that uh, we do know is that the bonds between us as individuals, between communities, between cities, between countries, are rather uneven, and we need to think about that if we're thinking of developing a business. Technology is developing at an ever-increasing rate, but the diffusion out into society is not all that even, and the complexity is also uneven. So this is quite a good starting point. To say, if we're going to develop large businesses in New Zealand, particularly for export, these are the things that we should understand, and there are more, and I'll come to those shortly. So it's all very well thinking about the next big thing, but I wanted to put up the example of the Pony Express. Who's heard of the Pony Express? That's great. So the Pony Express uh, came about in the mid-1800s in the uh, USA where there was great difficulty in communicating from the government on the east coast over to the west coast. There were wagon trains of course but this was fraught uh, with trouble because there were American Indians along the way and they didn't want settlers on their land so it became very difficult to, trans to um, communicate from the east to the west and the only other way around was to go down uh, by sailing ship uh, around the bottom of South America and up again or across the Panama Peninsula. It took a long time. So a group of entrepreneurs on the East Coast uh, said we should develop a chain of way stations from the Rockies across to the West Coast. We'll train a lot of young people as riders, we'll train a large number of horses, set up way stations, and it took them three years. And so in the mid-1800s, uh, the uh, Pony Express got underway carrying letters in the saddlebags of the horses. It lasted uh, about a few months, and then there was an event that put them out of business literally within two days. And so they were totally blindsided, and who'd like to hazard a guess as to how the Pony Express was blindsided? This is not a pub trivial question here. Uh, somebody has said the telegraph, and that's exactly right. Across the horizon, just after the Pony Express had been formed, there appeared a single copper wire, and that was carrying the telegraph. Not long after that, Samuel Morse came along with Morse code, and so the speed of transmission increased very, very substantially. That speed of transmission then enabled the management of railways, and the railways appeared very, very shortly after that. So that group of entrepreneurs, the business people on the East Coast that thought of the Pony Express and fell totally in love with that project were blindsided just in a few days by technology in the shape of the telegraph 
and then Morse code, and then the railways. And so one of the takeaways here is that we must not get blind, blindsided and fall in love with our science and technology. And I quite like this diagram to say it all depends. So quite often we think of ourselves in the middle of the network and we have a certain view of the world. And then though if we stand at another node and we look around, our view of the world is very, very different indeed. And, quite, and we need to be able to position ourselves literally in other people's shoes and their domain to see what their issues or requirements, their needs might be in which to develop engineering uh, and practical solutions for them. It all depends. So how might we uh, get an idea of the next big thing? And I thought, uh, once again, we should develop the social theme. If you think back not that long ago, we were living where we lived. In other words, we had close-knit communities. Uh, some years back, there was just one TV channel. So the chatter at uh, the schoolyard across the back fence uh, in, in clubs and pubs would be about the one TV channel, whether it was watching Mantovani or some of those other shows that many here will remember. That then developed into two TV channels and multiple uh, conversations then arose. So the complexity of the human interaction started to grow just around that one thought of going from one channel to two channels. I think people had more to talk about. Then along came the internet, uh, and then, if you think now, we are no longer living where we live. We have an enormous ability to tap into the knowledge worldwide and very, very fast. So the question is, and this is what leads us into uh, very large businesses, how do we corral, how do we harness the knowledge implicit in these very, very large communities? To me, that is one of the next big things. It's not enough, of course, just to discover an idea. Uh, we also have to invest. And here I've put, it's not, just the, it's not the investment in companies, it's the investment in our talented people, represented here tonight by investment in engineers and applied scientists. There are some good examples of how we might invest, and many will have seen uh, the advent of 3D printing. I thought this was a particularly good uh, example of 3D printing. Take a look at this cast for a broken arm, where the fellow that developed this was tired of seeing people with plaster casts or even quite heavy uh, fiberglass casts which get itchy, where, they, where the uh, doctor can't inspect what's going on. So look at this, which was developed with a 3D camera and then a home 3D printer. And it can, of course, be adjusted to have uh, the mesh around the area that's broken. But think of the breakthrough here achieved by 3D printing. This is a New Zealand development where a fellow has downloaded the complete uh, digital file of an Aston Martin. This is the James Bond famous Aston Martin. And so he was able to assemble off his home uh, 3D printer all of the panels that make up that car. And of course, that's the plug now for an aluminium body with which he'll build a Aston Martin. So these technologies are coming along very, very fast indeed. And this is an interesting one. It looks like a human person, but it was produced on a 3D printer. A life-size mannequin, complete uh, with correct coloring. But look at the texture, look at the folds in the clothing and the cap, all produced uh, from a, first of all, a 3D image a camera, and then developed or printed out uh, on a 3D printer. And of course, the famous uh, weapons, uh, there are now many of them available on the internet, uh, yet another but not very good application of the technology. 
So then we come to developing companies. So my theme here is that we need to be uh, almost uh, thinking of this a wee bit like hitting a golf ball or a tennis ball. It's not enough just to hit something, uh, a ball, it needs to follow through in order to get a good shot. So this, it's the same with investing, with discovering ideas. We need to develop them and continue to develop them, continue to invest in our really good people. I wanted here to say, if we think we're smart at forecasting, uh, take a look at some of these examples because if we understand how just wrong we've been in the past, perhaps we can uh, better forecast some of the, the opportunities that come along. So here's a good example. This appeared in, once again, the Popular Mechanics in 1960. And the article said that this was how computers would look in the year 2000. Look at the hand wheels. What on earth did they do? I don't know. And look at the, uh, the dials there. This is almost uh, suitable for uh, a power station control, but this was a computer. This was a serious forecast to say what a computer might look like in the year 2000. Look at the television set that they have as a, a readout. At least they got a line flow printer, which is not too bad. But this was a serious attempt at forecasting. How often do we forecast and get things so wrong as well because this is what a computer did look like in the year 2000. So here's a computer with what, a million times the power or something like that, just choose a number, with its own input and output and its own rudimentary display. Look how wrong those who were uh, living in 1960, how wrong they were in forecasting what computing might look like. So we need to think how wrong might we be in trying to forecast what is the next big thing. I wanted to raise this one because this is a device which brings together a laboratory on a chip. And it's all about DNA analysis. It was developed here in New Zealand uh, from particularly uh, the two universities of Auckland and Waikato. So hitherto, in order to analyze DNA from, say, saliva or hair or blood, it took about a, a day and a half. And the equipment would be the size of roughly a, a medium-sized refrigerator. That's been shrunk now to a laboratory on a chip, which is the size of a credit card. So, and this has been designed largely by mechanical engineers. So for those young people here, those parents here who have got youngsters heading into engineering, think about the, uh, the sub-disciplines that are available in the main branches of engineering. So here is a mechanical engineer understanding how to control fluids at the molecular level and how to get them flowing around the microscopic channels that you see there. A practical application of mechanical engineering that is very, very hard to conceive until you see it. So for those young people thinking of going into engineering, the world is, is awash with opportunity. So here's the forecast of what might be in the future, and I think it will be the future, or the fusion rather, of electronics and healthcare. There are several devices now which enable uh, hearing uh, for those who are deaf, and uh, the first flashes of light have been uh, sen uh, successfully transmitted through a bionic eye. But I think the one of chronic pain relief is very interesting. It's happening in Australia right now particularly, where engineers have found a way of embedding electrodes into a person's spinal cord. And the reason for that is that those with lower limb injuries who suffer chronic pain, if they take too much in the way of painkillers over a lifetime, then they may not feel too much of the chronic pain, but their kidneys and liver soon uh, and rapidly decay. 
So the engineers have found a way of embedding electrodes into the spinal cord with a small electronic pack which senses the pain signals and can effectively block out those pain signals from reaching their brain. An enormous improvement in well-being and the health care of people suffering from chronic pain. I think too there'll be the rise of new computational facilities operating at the nano level, the very molecular level, and literally we'll be getting supercomputers uh, in the size of a glass of water. And I mentioned 3D printing at home, because if you think it's not that long ago when it seemed that computers, sorry, where printers uh, costing about $100 would be available and they'd be commonplace in a home, homes having even two or three printers. Sure, they cost quite a lot uh, in terms of feeding them paper, but some things not all that they seem. Actually, things not sometimes all that they seem either because there was uh, an investor walking along uh, towards the Wellington railway station. He was in a bit of a hurry. He found he didn't have a watch. Ahead of him, he saw a fellow walking along with two very, very large bags struggling along, uh, along Lambton Quay. And so the investor uh, was in a hurry, didn't have the watch, went up to this fellow with the two bags and said, excuse me, I don't have a watch. Can you tell me the time? I think I may be running late. So it was an engineer who had these two big bags. And he put the bags down and he said, oh, it's uh, th coming up to 3.30. And the investor saw this watch and it was a big watch. It was always, it was connected up to the internet, always on, it had GPS, it had television, it had ten, uh, receiving 10 television stations, instant messaging, of course. And the investor said, wow, look at all that in one watch and this big flexible display. And he thought, I can make millions out of this. So he said to the engineer, oh, I'd like to buy that, how much? And the engineer said, ah, uh, uh, $10,000, said the investor. Oh, said the engineer, $20,000, said the investor, thinking, I'm still going to make a bundle out of this. And so the engineer said, oh, okay, $50,000, said the investor. The engineer said, okay. The investor got out his checkbook, wrote a check. The engineer took it, and the investor thought, I've got the bargain of the century here. And he raced away, still running late for his appointment, with the engineer running behind him with these two big bags saying, wait, 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 you've forgotten the batteries. <laughs> so things sometimes are not all that they seem. If we are going to inspire and uh, look after our up-and-coming engineers, they will need education, of course. So I thought it would be useful to take a look at some of the trends in education, trends uh, that have been around for a little while, but not too long so that they're well known. The first one of laureate universities. These, uh, this is a US company that recently received 200 million of funding from the World Bank. Think about what would happen if our university system received 200 million, and sorry, that's US dollars, from the World Bank. So this uh, network of universities has started. They're already in Auckland. They're going, uh, they have one site in Australia, and it's developing very, very rapidly. So for those in the university system, think about what this might mean to a bricks and mortar university. The next one down, Khan Academy. Has anyone looked at the uh, courses available in the Khan Academy? It's an amazing treasure trove of high school grade courses. Everything from mathematics to geography to geology uh, to the solution of partial differential equations. Just about everything you can imagine in three and a half thousand courses. And if you're an engineer, it's great to be able to look at uh, the geography or geology, for example. If you're a geologist, you can learn about microwave transmission lines. MOOCs, massive online open courses, bought uh, or uh, promoted through Coursera. They currently have three million students. 220 courses. There was a physics course mounted about a month ago, 
from a leading physicist at uh, MIT. It had 500,000 students. Now, these are not accredited courses, and there's quite a dropout rate. They're not accredited yet. However, there's a rise of third-party endorsement, or a moderation, rather, of those courses, so that then the host university uh, can start to issue degrees against that host university name. But look at those statistics. Three million students, 220 courses, and they've been going about two years. edX. The next one down is a joint venture between MIT and Harvard. They're talking about one billion students in 10 years, and they're rapidly getting to that level, or on track from a run rate point of view, to get to that level. So we need to think, if we're talking about investing, discovering good ideas here in New Zealand, we need to think about how we're going to inspire, but particularly how we're going to educate our young uh, engineers and, and scientists, designers and technologists because this is what's coming and this will be the way that many, many young people will get their education and training as well as in traditional universities. But our traditional universities, in my view, need to wake up and understand that that single copper wire is coming over the horizon very much like the Pony Express. The last one is called JAMS, which is run by IBM. And this is where IBM have a set of algorithms, a set of uh, software that can go out and crowdsource ideas. And so they have software, of course, which uh, can receive the ideas, and it can be in the tens or hundreds of thousands of ideas. Their software can look at the words that are used, the phrases that are used, and make inference from those words and phrases. Now, that's not terribly novel, but to be able to handle very, very large numbers of responses is quite an undertaking. But that's not all they do. Because in the case of, a, say, a city design, which has been done for Rio, for New York, for Rome, and a university in Australia that have done the same thing for their campus, the software, the algorithms, can take all of those responses can analyze what people are saying and then produce a 3D model, a 3D representation, a visualization of what people are really saying. And so imagine for a large city, then you can take a look at how people would like to see that city develop with, say, a transport corridor. And they'll mark, they are probably saying, we don't want high density housing uh, a long way away from transport. That seems a rather silly idea. So why not put high-density housing near a transport hub, then as you go out from that, so then go into lower-density housing. So these things are called jams, and I think you'll see them more and more, and it's a very, very interesting application of technology and represents a very interesting possibility for the future. And talking about the future, uh, many will have read William Gibson here, the novelist. I like these two quotes. The future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And the second one, the future is not Googleable. Well, it certainly isn't. So if we look forward now and think about uh, how we might spot these ideas, think about those uh, social networks, the social fabric, think about where we've come from, think about the, the essentially the ties that bind us, to use a somewhat hackneyed phrase, and think about the rise of technology, and particular, in particular, how are we going to support and uh, inspire our young engineers? Where are the pharmacists in Petoni who are going to stop kids making atom bombs and turn them onto uh, radio and wireless and therefore a career? And what about the, uh, the one-year-old at the bottom, who I'm sure uh, was probably only thinking of the photographer at the time, not about what engineering might be. But we need to invest in those young people. Because when you think about it, if we think of, say, 50 years hence, the people who are going to drive the prosperity of New Zealand, particularly through exporting, are already born. So they're not the subject of uh, past, or sorry, they've already been the subject of past policies. But we now have a responsibility in the profession to nurture, to inspire, to encourage those young people. 
We don't know where really the big idea or the big next big thing will come from, but we do know that it will come from well-educated and inquiring engineers who exercise and or do have a natural curiosity. So the vision that I have for our nation is that we do look after these young people, we do educate them well, we give them every support we can because it'll be largely through the discipline of engineering and all of the wonderful disciplines that are encompassed by engineering, the nuances of engineering that will help prosperity for our country. Sam. Thank you very, very, very much, Neville. Uh, you've led uh, an incredibly successful and um, continue to lead a very successful life. And, um, can everyone join me again in thanking Neville? Um, I think it's absolutely brilliant. Uh, we are going to run a session now with some questions. I know, Lyndon, I can't see anyone up there, but I know Lyndon and Michelle are hanging around with microphones so if you can flag them down they will kindly answer your question. Well I have a question if I can start things off since I have the microphone. Neville we've heard how you've invested and developed a lot of ideas and companies. Do you still do any discovering of ideas yourself? Every day. So uh, the, the country is very, very rich in, in ideas, in the universities, it's all happening in, in backyards and in, in uh, bedrooms of their mother's house, uh, which is where I started. So we, we're awash with really good ideas. It's how do we nurture those ideas, how do we invest in them, how do we uh, keep the cycle going? Does that answer the question okay? Thank you. No other questions? Yes, there's a question up oh. here. Hi Neville, thanks very much. Um, how do you spot a good idea as opposed to if you're awash with ideas, as opposed yeah. to uh, just chance? You have to kiss a lot of frogs. Uh, I think it's probably about uh, one idea in a hundred uh, is going to make it. There are lots of good ideas, but a lot of it uh, has been done before. A lot of it is me too. So I, I would say almost it's uh, about a one in a hundred. So you have to just uh, look, at, look at all those frogs and experiment, talk to people, uh, do research on the internet, talk to offshore networks, so it, it takes a lot of homework, and you're lucky to get uh, one or two investments a year uh, by that means. But that's not to say the other ideas are bad because they might aggregate and turn out to be, in total, a really good idea. But it's a pretty low success rate, and that's worldwide, not just New Zealand. We hear about all the great success stories, of, of course, from offshore, but behind every success story there would be uh, many, many hundreds of, uh, of unsuccessful ideas. I think just going on from that too, it doesn't take a huge world-beating idea to be successful. Sometimes uh, people let uh, excellence stand in the way of very good. And you've got to be sure that uh, we invest in people, not just what seems to be an idea with lots of sex appeal because people who are good, manage, good managers, who understand the science, the technology, the markets, how to get offshore, are a much better bet than somebody who has just fallen in love with a great idea. I, I want to ask, how important do you think practical um, experimentation for a, a young person is to develop those um, inquisitive ideas um, rather than sitting in front of a, a computer or an iPad or an iPhone these days and just looking at what, uh, what other people do? 
I, I think if people uh, are sitting in front of computers and learning, then it's not too bad a thing. But if they're just looking and, and using software that others have done, I think that's uh, not a particular good use of time. But I would be uh, very, very supportive of, um, of people being uh, practical. Uh, in my own case, I was very, very lucky to be pointed in the right direction, and I was always making things, doing things. And I think if you look at all of the uh, engineers who have had uh, good careers, uh, and people in applied science, pure sciences, you'll find that always, in their younger years, they've always been curious, making things, doing things, experimenting. And I think that's a natural growth of people to be uh, finding out about the natural world, the physical world, uh, and thereby learning. So I, I think it's, it's just critical. It's a wee bit uh, like um, perhaps uh, the chrysalis and a butterfly, that uh, the butterfly has to fight and struggle and find things out and finally break out of the cocoon. But if you do things for it, in other words, putting them in front of a, um, a computer screen where things have been done, if the chrysalis is broken open, the butterfly never flies. Uh, you talk about having to kiss sort of 99 frogs to find that sort of one prince. Um, as a society, um, I think we're sort of quite critical of failure. I suspect we actually need to be celebrating what I'd call positive failure to have people, in a sense, trying to yeah, be that 100th person. How, as a society, can we actually celebrate positive failure better? Yeah, I, I wouldn't use the word failure. I'd, I'd call it lack of success. <laughs> Um, and I think if we re reframe it, uh, then we can go a little way towards that. But look at what we've got with the America's Cup right now. You know, to see them not so long ago bailing water out of the America's Cup yacht that was a, a total disaster. And look now at those yachts and look and think about the engineering and science uh, in those yachts, the hydrodynamics, the, uh, the materials used, the, the psychological... Um, uh, work that's going in behind that, the tactics of the race, the communications, the, uh, the listening in to signals coming from those yachts, trying to find out what the competition is doing. So, uh, and that is hopefully success in the America's Cup, coming from quite abject failure in the past. So I think it's almost as though, uh, and who was it, um, uh, when Churchill, I think, was speaking to the Oxford Union, and he was asked, uh, was there anything he could say to the Oxford Union? And he stood up and he said, never, 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 never give up. And he sat down. <laughs> it's a long answer to the question. Oh. Sorry, uh, it's over here. Thank you. Oh. Uh, Neville, thank you so much for your talk. That was really um, inspiring. I was just wondering, I think... It's really easy to think of you know, people discovering, investing, and developing their own ideas. But in today's day and age, I think a lot of people are discovering and developing their own ideas. And um, they don't have investment themselves. So I'm wondering what practical advice you have for some people who um, are trying to find investors to dis so that um, the investor can discover and develop the ideas that a person already has. Uh, once again, I think the uh, person with the idea has to kiss a lot of frogs because there are uh, investors who won't invest in, say, uh, just an idea or very early stage or start-up companies. They will only invest in companies that, uh, where there's very little risk. So it's a matter of finding those uh, fairly philanthropic or benign investors who are patient and prepared, and prepared to support new ideas. So they're, they're around. You heard about one in the introduction. Yeah, uh, Neville, you've got an example of one particular investor you struggled to get funding from. Uh, for our ideas? Yes, yeah. for, your, for your ideas, yeah. Um, perhaps a, uh, a new fund which was based on uh, the uh, kind of funds of the past. So these are where you can aggregate money and then invest. So. Um, a, a lot of people um, uh, don't really uh, get, in my view, the, uh, the fact that if we don't invest 
in, in our society as well as in, in hard assets, then we won't have much left in the future. So that, that's where some people struggle, and that's, I, that's one product, one idea that is a bit hard to get away. Does that answer the question? So it's not just a product or an idea, but, but an actual fund to support the things we're talking about tonight. Hi, Neville. Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I guess my question's around... There are some great technologies developed in New Zealand, and uh, so Wellington Drive Technology and Raycon are listed companies, but looking at their share price, they've been let down by their senior management, which doesn't seem to be up to, up to snuff, really. How, how do we take these great technologies, but how does New Zealand develop that management capability to, to make sure that they succeed? I have to draw a breath here. <laughs> um, I, I can't uh, comment on those two companies. Um, and I, as a disclaimer, I'm not a shareholder in either of those companies. But I think that quite often there's a failure that people think they've done well and therefore they can do well in the future. But those who have the ideas, those who start the companies, those who then take it through the first step, uh, and then those who then develop it, say from a $10 million to a $100 million company, those are all different kinds of people. And I think the, the, the uh, problem that we have oftentimes is that the founders often think that the skills that it's taken uh, to found a company are transferable to a larger company and a public listed company. And that is just not so in many cases leading to the kinds of things you've been talking about. You have to give things up in order to succeed. I think, is, is it a Chinese proverb? Less is more, or, or give up to succeed. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, you said the new direction kind of in your company and your ideals is to be more socially conscious in your investing. And I was just wondering how you guys tease apart the like implications when you're investing in something. How do you know whether it's ethically good down the road? Like, how do you understand the implications of what you're doing? Where do you get those ideas? Who's coming up with that? There's a very good uh, organisation underneath the United Nations. It's called uh, Principles of Responsible Investment. So they have uh, more or less a charter saying uh, what is responsible investment but more particularly what is not. So uh, in their view, alcohol is not, uh, cigarettes uh, is not, uh, in extractive industries are not. So um, uh, then defining in, uh, in um, possible investments as being responsible is a, is a good guide right there. So that's one of the examples. A lot of it then too is how do you feel inside? Do you really want to invest in some of the stuff or not really? So um, a lot of it comes down to the individual. And I think as you get older and wiser, and uh, I tried to uh, elaborate on that theme here, you do finally understand how the world works. Um, I think. I have a question on engineering and business. We live in New Zealand. Is there a scenario whereby there are foreign investors invest in a country whereby we have the re human resources, we have the land, we have the commodity, and it create jobs for New Zealander, and it boosts our economy because of um, employment. Is this possible, or has it been happening now? So is the question, um, um, if, if companies go offshore, are, are we necessarily losing the intellectual property, is, and it's a negative thing for the country? Is that the question? Uh, my question is, look at Asia, countries like Singapore and Malaysia. There are so many multinational investments that create jobs. So um, in New Zealand, we have human resources, we have the land, we have the space, we have the talent. Is it possible for big multi-company like um, IBM and all that invest in New Zealand to set up factories to create jobs for us and in a way in improve our economic development? Yeah, it is possible. Um, in those countries though, that you've mentioned, there are some very, very big incentives for the large companies uh, to set up uh, particularly research and development in those countries, and we just don't have those in the policy settings of government. So it's a lot more difficult here. Um, there are some signs, but it, the policies are not just there. The money, the money, the incentives are not there. So those companies will often go to Asia or Australia. I, after that, I...
far be it from me to define government policy. Thank you once again, Yvonne. We look forward to seeing you your future work um, in these areas and um, following you with even, even greater admiration. Um, join me once again. Thank you, Neil. Thank you.